Over to you, Acham Brahmani. Okay. Thank you, Bobby. And hello, everyone. Nice to, I, I can't see you, but I'm sure you're out there somewhere. So nice to be with you again. And I hope you're all keeping well because uh, these are interesting times. Yeah, when you have the, the COVID and you have all these problems in the world, uh, it makes life more interesting. Yeah. But one of the uh, things that is so, uh, what is actually really interesting about the, uh, the COVID situation and any difficulties you have in your life, whether it's COVID or any other problem really, is that often it tends to make us turn around, turn in a different direction uh, and look at life in a new way. And it makes us often more kind. It makes us more spiritual people. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple because when you understand that the world uh, outside is out of control, uh, and uh, you know, it's always gonna end up with suffering and problems and there's always gonna be impermanence and you can't really, it's also unreliable. When, when you realize that you actually start to turn towards a spiritual life instead, you start to turn for your happiness, for your meaning, for all of these things uh, inside rather than outside. Uh, and this is kind of one of the great uh, benefits of uh, having difficulties uh, that if you use the difficulties in the wise way, then actually, it ends up being like a blessing in disguise. Uh, and this is such a, an important thing to realize. So never, uh, never make uh, One of the um, uh, kind of very important things uh, uh, in this is of course the, uh, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to be able to uh, have success uh, in uh, uh, using the spiritual path. Uh, one of the most important things is, is to be able to uh, have those Kalyana Mittas, people who support you, so you know where to find that refuge in the Dhamma. Yeah, you know which kind of people to allow you to support you uh, and uh, where to find true spiritual teachings. Because in the end, it's only the true spiritual teachings, uh, teachings that are based on uh, seeing things in the right way according to reality that are going to be helpful for you. And for this reason, one of the most important things on the Buddhist path is the idea of the Kalyana Mitta, the wise companion or the kind or the good companion that we have with us. It's such an important thing because if you have the wise companion on the path, then you also have a right view. You have access to the teachings that look at the world in the right way. And because you have the wise companion uh, who inspire you and you show you what right view is all about, uh, it encourages you and it takes you forward uh, and it gives you access to these teachings that are uh, so useful in making sense of difficulties and making your life a, uh, a better even in the face of great difficulties. Uh, so the idea of Kalyana Mitta is absolutely fundamental on the Buddhist path. Uh, and I've talked about this many times before, also at the BF. Uh, so, uh, but I'm not going to talk directly about Kalyanamitta today, because Kalyanamitta is about how we relate to the Buddha, how we relate to uh, teachers in the world, and how we relate to the Dhamma. But today I want to turn it around, just to have a look at things in a slightly different way. Uh, and that is to ask, how can we be Kalyanamitta to other people? Uh, yeah, how can we be wise companions to others on the spiritual path? How can we support the people around us, the Buddhist in our lives, our family members, our friends, our acquaintances, uh, our colleagues, whoever it is? Uh, what, can, what are the qualities that we need to develop and to show to be able to actually help people in this way? So this is instead of us looking for Kalyanamittas, it is us being Kalyanamittas uh, to other people uh, and this is what this is going to be uh, uh, the focus of this particular talk here. And uh, to, to start out with, it is important to realize that being a true Kalanamitta to other people is actually very hard. It's difficult. And uh, the reason why it is difficult is because uh, uh, these, uh, the idea of right view, of seeing the world in the right way, is actually very profound. Uh, it takes insight, it takes deep meditation experiences, uh, it takes all of these things that actually only really happen through a very developed mind. Uh, and that developed mind only comes about if you practice on and on for often for many years, uh, sometimes for decades. Uh, and in the end, the only 
real way that you're going to be able to support other people at the end of the day is if you are an Arya yourself, a noble one, uh, someone who has insight into these teachings. Uh, yeah. And there's a beautiful simile in the suttas, and I, I always love the similes of the Buddha because they are often so evocative and so to the point and so beautiful. Uh, and there's a simile where the Buddha talks about two people who are, uh, or a person who is stuck in the mud stuck in the mud, maybe it's quicksand, maybe they are sinking in deeper and deeper, yeah? And this is a, a, a metaphor here for the ordinary person in the world. They are stuck in the mud. The mud is the mud of delusion, the mud of desires, the mud of ill will, the mud of all these uh, uh, distortions in our mind, but we cannot really see the world properly here. And um, so when you are stuck in the mud, what do you require? Well, you require someone who is not stuck in the mud to help you out. Yeah, someone who is kind of standing on the dry land outside the mud. Maybe he throws in a rope or a stick or something that you can grab hold of, and then they will pull you out of the mud. And of course, the person who is staying, staying on dry land is a person who is not stuck in the mud of delusion, the mud of desire, the mud of ill will, but who actually is separated from that and then has the ability to see the world in a different way and to pull you out. But if you are stuck in the same mud, if you are also just an ordinary person with the same difficulties as the other one, well, then you can't really pull someone else out. Yeah, You can't pull someone else out because you're both stuck in the same swamp. Uh, often you just encourage each other to sink even more deeply into the mud, fall into the quicksand, and eventually getting buried in the whole problem. And so samsara and suffering just carries on there. So often we need to get ourselves out of the mud, first of all, before we can help someone else to get out of the mud. And this is the, this is the, the hard thing here. So uh, what that means in practice, uh, it means that one of the most compassionate, uh, one of the most important things that you can do in your own life, uh, yeah, in, in terms of helping others, in terms of being a, a spiritual friend in terms of being the Kalanamita, one of the most important things you can do is to look after your own practice. Because by looking after your own practice, you are ensuring that you are getting out of that mud. You are ensuring that gradually you are moving on to the dry land next to it. Yeah? And then the more out of the mud you are, the more ability you have to help other people. And this is one of those strange things yeah it's very strange that uh, uh, it is an act of compassion for others to look after your own practice uh, sometimes people say that it is uh, selfish or we're just looking after ourselves uh, uh, and because they say that uh, but, but that is actually a misunderstanding it is not really selfish uh, when we are looking after our own practice because we are uh, enabling ourselves to help other people by doing that. We are stepping out of the mud and allowing ourselves the opportunity to, uh, to actually be more of assistance to other people. Those weird things, yeah, that actually just looking after your own practice actually is an act of compassion for everyone. And uh, what that means is that um, when you sit down and you meditate, for example, or when you undertake the five precepts, uh, as we just did with Brother uh, Bobby before. Uh, uh, when you do these things, actually remember, it is not just for you. Uh, you're doing it for humanity. Uh, you're doing it for your fellow uh, spiritual practitioners at the BGF. You're doing it for your family. You're doing it for your acquaintances. Uh, you're doing it for everyone when you do these things. Uh, so remember, these things are actually, they are acts of generosity. Uh, taking the five precepts, you're having compassion for the world, you're being generous to everyone, and you are uh, doing something far more than just looking after yourself. And when you remember that, yeah, when you make your meditation an act of kindness or generosity, when you make taking the five precepts an act of generosity, it becomes very beautiful, it becomes very powerful, and it gives you a joy that comes to meditation like this. Meditation only works if you have joy. Yeah, the more joyful you are, the more powerful the meditation becomes. And by making the meditation into an act of generosity, where you see yourself as supporting other people, you bring the joy almost automatically into the meditation practice. 
idea here is that when we are true Kalyana Mittens, it is beneficial for others. We are developing our own practice. We bring joy into our meditation. And the whole thing just comes together in such a beautiful way. And this is one of the powerful things about this. And uh, there is a nice story about, uh, this is a story about Ajahn Brahm, who uh, all of you uh, probably know. Yeah, it's very hard to find anyone who doesn't know Ajahn Brahm these days. So it, it, probably you all know Ajahn Brahm uh, pretty well. And of course, I know him very well. And I've been living with Ajahn Brahm for 20, 26 years almost. And he uh, tells the story that when he was a young monk in Thailand, he had uh, just been asked by Ajahn Shah, a very, very powerful monk in Thailand. He had just been asked by Ajahn Shah to go to Australia to help with establishing a monastery in Australia. And uh, there was a, a hiatus, there was a, a gap before he could go, maybe a month or two. And he decided that during that period, that month or two before he was going, he was going to practice really hard. Why? So he could be of extra benefit for the people of Australia when he eventually he came down to Australia. So uh, he said that instead of having his customary uh, rest after the meal, for example, uh, Ajahn Brahm would then get out on the walking path, even if he was a bit tired, develop the energy in the mind, overcome this, uh, and make something special out of that situation. Why? So that he could be more of benefit uh, for the people he was going to serve in Australia when eventually he came to Australia. And this is the idea of using your meditation as an act of charity, an act of generosity to people around you. You put in that extra effort, you give it that extra joy to make sure that actually it has more power, both for yourself, but also for the people around you. So make everything in your life an act of generosity or kindness, and then you are uh, be, being of great benefit both for yourself uh, and of course also for the people around you at the same time. Uh, but um, that is uh, uh, the kind of the, if you like it, and that is how the, uh, the path works. If you are very skilled with using your act of generosity to support others in this way, being a real Kalyanamitta, but uh, not everyone is an area in this world. Not everyone has a very developed mind. What are the other aspects of being a Kalyanami, being a wise companion, as Bobby puts it in the title of the talk? What is the idea of being a wise man on the path? And there are uh, quite a number of suttas, and the suttas are the word of the Buddha, where the Buddha teaches his monastics and the lay people. There's quite a number of suttas about the Kalyana Mitta and what qualities they have. And there's one sutta in particular in the numerical discourses of the Buddha. This is the Anguttara Nikaya in the eighth, where the Buddha talks about the four qualities of the Kalyana. Yeah, and these are not the qualities of an Arya, not the qualities of a Buddha necessarily. These are the qualities of ordinary people that we meet in ordinary life. How do we you know, what are the qualities that we need to develop uh, to be able to inspire others so they can emulate us uh, and to us and they will go in the same direction. Uh, and the four qualities that the Buddha talks about are uh, the qualities of faith. Yeah, this is Sadha in Pali. It can also be translated as uh, uh, confidence. Uh, faith and confidence are basically the same uh, in, uh, uh, in this case. Uh, uh, the second quality is the virtue or the sila. The third quality is generosity, uh, known as chaga in Pali. And the last quality, the fourth one, is wisdom or panya. Yeah, so these are the four things that make you a kalyanamitta to other people. Uh, so if you want to be a good companion in the spiritual life, uh, these are kind of the areas that you want to look at. Uh, faith, virtue, generosity and wisdom. Yeah, these are the other four things. And uh, uh, these four things, when you look at them, they are all about uh, how we are outwardly as human beings. Yeah, virtue is how is expressed and how we deal with other people. Generosity is expressed in the same way. Wisdom often shines through in, again, how we talk, the things that we talk about, uh, 
uh, how we deal with difficult situations, uh, how we deal with difficult people, uh, that is where wisdom kind of shines through. Uh, um, being a Kalinamitta is not so much about telling other people about the Dhamma, uh, yeah, and telling them this is the best or you must be a Buddhist or whatever, because that often backfires. It is more about how we live our lives, how we inspire others, uh, and how we make other people emulate what we're doing uh, by uh, living in the right way, by being good examples of people. That is really what this is up to. And uh, so let us have a quick look at these four particular factors and see what they actually, what does it mean to have faith, for example? And uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, faith in Buddhism is uh, often obviously a very personal thing. Yeah, if you have confidence in the Buddhist teachings, uh, it is not necessarily something that people can tell from the outside. But it is important to remember that if you have faith, you have to express that faith to people in a way that they can relate to her. One of the biggest problems of being, you know, an adherent to a particular religion or a particular or a particular or whatever it is, is that we tend to be very enthusiastic about what we're doing here. But if you are too enthusiastic, you tend to put people off rather than actually draw them in. So the right way to show your faith is actually more questions rather than what you teach. And I, I remember myself very much in the early days when I had just become a Buddhist monk. I was super duper enthusiastic about the teachings. And I wanted to convert the whole world. I thought my family, they all needed to hear about Buddhism and all of this. I was going to tell them all about the Dhamma and all of that. But of course, it doesn't work that way. And very often it backfires. Yeah? It backfires because people don't really want to be told what to do. And I learned very quickly that the best way to convert other people or to make them listen to the Dhamma is actually to bring quiet and to act and to live in the right way. And when you live in the right way, when you have compassion for your family members, for respect to your parents, when you are kind to your brother and sister, yeah, in a way you have never done before because you are inspiring, that is how you show your faith. And then you kind of come along and they start to listen to what you have to say as a, as a consequence of that. So faith needs to be expressed in the right way. And when it is expressed in the right way, then uh, it starts becoming uh, very, very powerful. Uh, so uh, it is about understanding the teachings coming from the right point of view. Uh, and that's when it actually starts to, uh, starts to work uh, in that particular way. Uh, so um, um, another important aspect of faith, uh, which I uh, uh, recommend you to follow is to remember that uh, very often you show your faith, your appearance to the word of the Buddha. Uh, yeah. So when I teach, for example, I always like to come back to the word of the Buddha. What did the Buddha teach? Uh, yeah. And I would also recommend you to, instead of trying to teach too much from your own personal experience, come back to the word of the Buddha and at the very least relate your personal experiences. Uh, to the word of the Buddha. It is uh, interesting, I have always reflected that the reason why I can be a Buddhist monk and why I can live this uh, wonderful life in the little kuti uh, in the forest in Australia is because of Buddha. the Buddha is the one who makes this possible for me. And because of that, I have a debt of gratitude to the Buddha. The Buddha is the uh, person who makes this whole Buddhism possible. And because of debt of gratitude to the Buddha, what I should do is point people in the direction of things of the Buddha. Yeah, that is what I should be doing. That is the main job for me as a monastic. Yeah. And I would recommend you that you also show your faith in a kind of similar way. Yeah. Your faith should come through your understanding that these teachings of the Buddha, this is the essence of what Buddhism is about. Yeah. And point people in that direction, point to some, uh, maybe beautiful passages in the suttas, uh, some inspiring verses that you find, for example, in the, in the Dhammapada, uh, some, uh, uh, some beautiful gems that are actually found in these uh, marvelous teachings of the Buddha. And as you do that, then you are guiding people in the right direction. You're giving them direct access uh, to the treasure, which is the Buddha's word. Uh, 
Yeah, it's this beautiful treasure, the word of the Buddha. And sometimes it is a shame that people are not ready to listen to that treasure. Yeah? But at the very least, we should point people in that direction. Yeah? And it reminds me, I was just uh, uh, talking to someone a while ago, and they uh, told me this nice little story about uh, they were sitting uh, with Ajahn Brahm here at the Bodhinyana Monastery. And there were guests, and there was a couple that were just coming up. There was a young man and a young woman. Uh, they were coming up to see Ajahn Brahm. And uh, they said to Ajahn Brahm that we are about to get married, and we would like some advice before our our ceremony before we kind of tie the knot and we get married together. Yeah. And so Ajahn Brahm asked them, well, what, what would you like to hear about? And the young man in the couple, he said, I would like to hear something about anger, how to manage anger so that we can have a more enduring relationship together. Yeah. And then Ajahn Brahm gave them a beautiful talk. Yeah, a beautiful talk full of emotion and wise advice and uh, book that was meaningful in a very profound sense to the couple. Uh, and it was so meaningful that after a while, they both started to shed some tears because of the beauty and the power in that situation. Uh, and then Ajahn Brahm carried on talking a little bit about the, you know, how to live together as a couple, how to see each other as a unit rather than as individual people, and to think of us rather than to think of me or you as individuals. Uh, the kind of way that Ajahn Brahm likes to present the Dhamma. And at the end, they were very inspired uh, and they were very grateful for that talk. Uh, in other words, they had been ready to listen to the Dhamma. Yeah, they were ready for this. Uh, and then just as they were about to leave, there was another man in the room. He was at the back of the room. Uh, he was kind of pacing up and down. Yeah, it was, seemed a bit restless. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm said to him, well, if you want to have a chat with me, please, you know, now is a good time. Uh, so the man comes up. Uh, and uh, Ajahn Brahm asks him, what are you here for? What would you like? Yeah. And the man says, I would like a blessing for uh, wealth and good fortune in the future. Yeah. yeah, wealth and good fortune in the future is not usually the kind of things that you give blessing for as a monk. You might give blessing for someone's health, or you might give blessing for someone's uh, success in the Dhamma practice, but uh, wealth is a bit kind of uh, unusual. Uh, so anyway, Ajahn Brahm gives him a quick blessing to wish him good luck. Yeah. And then as soon as the, the man just leaves. Uh, and after the man has left, uh, uh, Ajahn Brahm turns to his Upatak, his attendant, uh, and he says to the Upatak, yeah, that was a man who was not able to see the real treasure. Yeah. And this is uh, a problem in life. Yeah, sometimes you point people to the treasure in the world. Uh, you point them to the teachings of the Dhamma. You point them to so many of these beautiful things where real happiness is to be found in life. And yet, if you are not ready, if you can't do it, then you won't be able to see what is going on. So our job as Kalyanamita, our job as good companions on the path to show our faith is to point people in the right direction. Sometimes it will work. Sometimes it will not work but never allow yourself to be discouraged if it doesn't work. There will always be some people who benefit from our work and our pointing people in the right direction, and that is what matters. If you can help one person in your life, you have done so much good already, and that is really what it should be about. So that is just a little bit of the idea of faith and knowing where to place your faith and having faith in the right thing and all of that. Then there is the, uh, the two other three factors. They have, you have generosity, and we also have the idea of sila. Yeah, these are uh, obviously very important factor, uh, factors, uh, being generous, being virtuous, living well. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I have, in my life, I've always been very uh, inspired by people who live really well, people who have kind of people who show compassion, people who are generous, take you out, etc., etc. I've always been inspired by that. When you see people like that, you know that there is something going on in the deep level with these people. Those are the people I trust. Those are the people I place my faith and confidence. Those are the people I follow after, like the Buddha, like Ajahn Brahm, like other people who have these good qualities inside. 
So if we also can emulate those good qualities, uh, then uh, there will be powerful pointers for other people to understand where they should go to seek the Dhamma, to seek teachings. Uh, and um, again, I remember some instances in my life when this became very clear to me. And one of those instances, this was uh, before I had become a monk. I was living in England at one of the monasteries in England. I was an agarika over there at the time. Uh, and I had a connection with one of the other monks. Uh, and one of the other monks, he was a young monk. He had only just ordained only a year or two before, uh, recently. Uh, and he had become very interested in the teachings of Ajahn Brahm, even though Ajahn Brahm was living in Australia, and this was in the UK. He had heard Ajahn Brahm teaching, and he was very inspired by the teachings of Ajahn Brahm. And so he shared with me some of the things that he had done with Ajahn Brahm. And one of the things that he had done, he had written a letter to Ajahn Brahm and asked Ajahn Brahm about dependent origination. Yeah. So a very kind of intellectual letter about all the details of dependent origination, about how it fits with the suttas, is dependent origination, is it a, a three lifetime thing, is it a one lifetime thing, is it a momentary thing, how does it all work? And he, so he wrote to Ajahn Brahm, remember he was just a young monk, yeah, he was just starting out. At this point Ajahn Brahm was already a senior Mahatera, had over 20 years, 20 years as a monk already, this is about 25, 26, 27 years ago. And so he was just this young upstart compared to Ajahn Brahm. So he writes Ajahn Brahm, this, this letter asks about all of these things. Yeah? And this was before the time of the internet. So you had to actually wait for the physical delivery of letters. And then a couple of weeks later comes the reply from Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? And it was this extraordinary reply here. And he shared it with me, and this is how I know about this, because he shared this reply with me later on. I'm probably one of the very few people in the world who is aware of that this even happened. Ajahn Brahm would be aware of it, of course, but otherwise I'm one of the, one of the few ones. And so he got this reply by, from Ajahn Brahm, and the monk, he showed me the reply, and it was an extraordinary reply here. What was extraordinary about it? There's many things that was extraordinary about it, but uh, one of the things that was extraordinary was the, was the, was the understanding of the suttas. Uh, here was a monk, yeah, Ajahn Brahm was this monk who really had a very good understanding of the Dhamma. When he wrote about dependent origination, he would quote the suttas in great detail. Uh, he would show that he would reference between various places uh, to understand what was going on. Uh, and by quoting, that is how he made his case, yeah, uh, by quoting the suttas. And you may, perhaps this does not seem so uh, remarkable to you, but it was quite revolutionary at the time, because very much the Thai tradition of doing things <clears throat> is often very much a tradition of passing things on from teacher to disciple. And it's actually very rare within the Thai system to read into the suttas, to understand what the Buddha was teaching. It's actually not that common. But Ajahn Brahm, he was a true disciple of the Buddha. So he quoted the word of the Buddha throughout for what dependent origination is about. And I remember seeing that. And I thought it was so inspiring. Yeah, I thought it was so inspiring because uh, we often argue with each other, and one monk may have one interpretation, another monk may have a different interpretation. What is the real thing? Yeah? And the answer is, uh, to find the real thing, we have to go back to the word of the Buddha. And here was someone who had understood that, someone who went to the source, someone who went to the basis, the foundation of what Buddhism is all about. Uh, and I found that myself extraordinarily inspiring, because it was the kind of faith uh, that the Buddha himself had. Uh, yeah, the Buddha recommended place faith in the suttas, and here was someone who actually followed those instructions. So to me, it was a really large eye-opener when I saw that. And the second thing about this letter that was so fascinating yeah, was just the way it was written. Looking at the words, looking at the letters that Ajahn Brahm, the way he had written this, and if you look at the way this was written, it was extraordinary. Every letter was almost sculpted. Yeah, it looked like a printed letter. And every time the letter appeared word after another one, it looked almost exactly the same. It looked like a printed page, but it was handwritten. 
Yeah, it looked like a printed page, but it was handwritten. Every word was almost exactly perfectly written. It was done in pen. There was no crossings out. It's almost as if he had written everything down without making a single mistake. And everything was sculpted to perfection, word after word, looking like a printed page, except, <coughs> excuse me, except that it was much more beautiful than ordinary print because the letters were sculpted so beautifully. And when you saw that, you had this feeling that this must be a person who has a very developed mind. How is it possible to write such a letter? To this in a second, it was a very long letter. It was about 10 pages long, yeah, replying to this young monk. And every throughout those 10 pages, it was completely consistent, uh, written in exactly the same way all the way throughout. Uh, and the feeling I had when I saw that was that this is a person with a very developed mind, uh, someone who is able to be consistent for a long, long period of time, uh, to write with extraordinary accuracy and all this period. This is not how ordinary people write. Uh, there's something special about this. Uh, this person must have some other ability than most people have. Uh, that was the feeling I had at the time when I saw that. Uh, but so that is the second thing that came out of that letter. And the third thing that came out of that letter, uh, and this was, I think, maybe for me, the most powerful experience of all, uh, was that here was a young monk uh, at the monastery far away. He sends a letter to Ajahn Brahm all the way down in Australia. And then Ajahn Brahm takes the time to write out a long letter, yeah, long, 10 pages long. It, was, it must have taken him, I don't know how long to write this letter. And 10 pages long, out of compassion for someone he has probably barely met for in the UK, writes it out in detail. And it was just the kindness, the compassion of a senior monk looking after a junior monk in such a remarkable way that was so was the most powerful experience for me. I was not used to senior people looking at younger people in that way. I was not look, used to compassion, generosity, and virtue being expressed in such a unusual way at all until I saw this letter from Ajahn Brahm. And straight away, I was just so attracted to this monk. Yeah, you can imagine when you meet someone like that uh, and you hear about someone, you feel really attracted to them uh, because you know that here is someone who's going to look after you. Here is someone who cares. Uh, here is someone who is giving something special to the world, world around them. Uh, and this was the feeling I had when I saw that letter from Ajahn Brahma. Uh, and that was one of the critical things that actually made me decide to move from the UK to Australia because I felt I here I was in the presence of something special, something extraordinary, something that would sustain me in my monastic life. Someone who would be a true Kalyana Mitta, a wise companion on the path. So I'm saying all of this simply because I want to show you the power of kindness in the world. If you are kind to people, if you are generous to other people in a similar way to what Ajahn Brahm was in this particular case. Um, of course, you can't go too far. You have to know the limits of the kindness. You can't spend your whole day just uh, writing letters, of course. But um, uh, the idea is that when we do something special for other people, uh, when we do something that is obviously coming from our heart in a very deep way, uh, it affects other people. Uh, and sometimes I don't think we quite understand how deeply it affects other people. Uh, uh, kindness spreads out like ripples in the pond. Uh, you have the ripples in the pond going out. You drop a stone in the middle and then the ripples spread out afterwards. Uh, and it affects so many people in the world around us. Uh, it goes to a person who gets inspired by our kindness and then moves on to someone else. Uh, so kindness is this very powerful and very, very uh, uh, it touches people's hearts in a very deep way. And that is exactly what it did with me in this particular case. Uh, so I underestimate that I start to understand why this draws people in uh, and it gives people the special confidence and why it makes you a good Kalyanamitta, a good companion, if you live in this particular way. Uh, there's one other story that I thought I would uh, maybe tell very briefly. It's a very simple one. This is also about uh, Ajahn Brahm, how he acts as a, 
a good spiritual companion and how he does that through kindness and generosity and all of these kind of things. And, and this was a, a story many years ago, Ajahn Brahm was uh, uh, sitting at the Dhammaloka Center giving his Friday night talks. He's done that for many, many years now, 30 years or whatever it is. Uh, and um, uh, as he was sitting there, uh, yeah, he, he uh, looked into the audience. And as he looked into the audience, uh, he saw a lady sitting in the audience who he knew had made him a pair of socks. Yeah, she had uh, knitted these socks herself. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm realized that he was actually wearing those socks right there and then. So while he was talking, uh, as an act of kindness and generosity, uh, making it obvious, uh, yeah, doing it kind of in a ambiguous um, way, he gradually he took his foot out from his robe, yeah, lifted up his robe a little bit, uh, moved his foot out uh, and kind of wiggled his toe just to enable that lady to see he was wearing her socks. Yeah, so he wiggled his toe and then he saw that this lady, she actually noticed. And then he could see that this lady, she said to the another friend who was sitting next to her, her he said, she said, uh, like in a hushed tone, yeah, in a low voice, he said to this friend, oh, look, he is wearing my socks. And uh, <laughs> of course, she was very happy with that. She was so satisfied to see that Ajahn Brahm was actually making use of her gift. Uh, and, uh, but the point here again is this idea of caring for others, uh, yeah, understanding that you have the ability to lift someone else's mood up. You have an ability to give them the gift of happiness. Uh, and so that is so easy. Uh, all you have to do is just to wiggle your toes a little bit, uh, that someone sees that they're wearing your socks uh, and you actually spread happiness in the world in that particular way. Uh. So, um, these are, again, the simple ideas, yeah, simple ways of sharing kindness and happiness. And Ajahn Brahm tells another story. This was in Melbourne, away from here, where he was, again, there was a, an, he was visiting an old lady who had, again, knitted him her socks. And on his way out, he would just very gently, he would kind of pull his socks up a little bit uh, so that she could see that uh, he was wearing socks that uh, she had made for him. Uh, and again, there's this, touching little, small little things that are really touching to people and kind of make life something extra. You're giving something to other people, make them, uh, make their hearts kind of uh, soft and gentle. And then that is where they are able to listen to the Dharma. They get drawn into Buddhism because they see a kindness. They see something that is very profound and beautiful. So please uh, ensure that you do these things and you will draw people to you. You will draw people to the Dhamma. You will be a true spiritual companion if you have this kind of happiness, uh, this, sorry, this kind of friendliness, this kind of kindness uh, in your life. Uh, it is interesting that, um, in Buddhism, we have something called the uh, four Sangaha Vattusa. Yeah, Sangha, Sangaha means to collect or to gather. And a vattu is like a basis or an element from people together. And these four elements, four people together, this is how if you want to have a large following, yeah, you want to have lots of people to come to whatever, uh, the way to do those four things that make people follow you around and listen to you are, um, so what are they again? I'll see if I can remember this, are a, a kind speech, yeah, gentle speech, Straight away, people are very fascinating, interested in you if you are gentle speech. It is generosity. Yeah, you are generous to other people. Uh, whenever you have the opportunity, you do helpful actions to other people. In other words, you are kind. You use the opportunity to be kind to others. You can help them in whatever way. And the last one is treating people uh, equally. You're not having kind of friends. Some people prefer to others. Uh, and you will notice that these four ways are quite similar to the four things I'm talking about now that kind of make you a good spiritual companion. Yeah, you have kindness of speech, you have the generosity, and you have the uh, sympathetic actions, kind actions towards others. But all this is very closely related to the idea of generosity uh, and virtue in particular. So you draw people in, you draw people in to have a following which is similar to drawing them in. To listening to the Dhamma and to be a good spiritual in this particular way. 
Anyway, I, uh, the last quality uh, of these uh, five, four qualities is the quality of wisdom. Yeah, and wisdom is, has always been to me the most powerful and beautiful of all the true qualities and because it is a quality that uh, um, shows that we understand about life, that we know how to react to life, that we know how to deal with things in a wise way. We're able to overcome problems. Uh, wise people are the people we go to and that we seek out when we have a problem or an issue. And they're often able to show us uh, how to deal with things yeah, very often in a very simple way. Wisdom is often very simple, but when you hear it, it may sound absolutely obvious, uh, but seeing the obvious is in large part what wisdom actually is about. So wisdom is about simple things like knowing when to speak and not to speak, yeah? knowing that certain people are open to listen to you, other people are not open to listen to you. Yeah? Not the right time, not the wrong time. Yes, yeah? simple things like that is often what wisdom is about. Yeah? But wisdom is also about other things. Yeah? It's about the qualities that come out of you. One of the uh, remarkable things about the Sutta is that people who are very developed in wisdom, who have gone a long way on the path, uh, they tend to be joyful people. They tend to have light hearts. Uh, they tend not to be too serious. Yeah, They uh, make life fun and enjoyable. And the Dhamma should really be fun and enjoyable in a particular way, in a spiritual kind of way. We should enjoy this path. It should be give value to our lives. It shouldn't be something which is too harsh and too unbearable. Of course, sometimes we have to restrain it, but a lot of it should be also something we do for the joy of it. And uh, there is a, a story that Ajahn Brahm tells me that kind of gives you this uh, idea of what it means to be uh, you know, how this comes out in people's action. Now, there is a, a quite a famous Thai monk. I don't know if you heard about this Thai monk. His, uh, his name was Ajahn Singtong, and he uh, lived, he died back in 1980. He was part of a plane crash. There was three monks in the plane. The plane went down. All the three monks died as a consequence of the plane uh, falling out of the sky, basically. And of course, it was a big uh, loss to Buddhism in Thailand because this particular monk, especially Ajahn Singtong, he was very famous uh, and he was so loved by so many people. Uh, and many people say he was uh, you know, one of those uh, meditation masters that Thailand has uh, uh, brought out over, uh, over the years, especially the northeast of Thailand. Uh, so when uh, Ajahn Brahm was about five reigns, he was staying at Wat Nanat Chat at this particular time, uh, he was doing a year of Tudong. Tudong is when you travel around, you wander from monastery to monastery, you find nice to meditate, yeah, and you enjoy the kind of that freedom of just being a wandering monk. Yeah? And it's very common in Thailand to do this after your five, uh, fifth reigns as a monk. And this was Ajahn Brahm's time to go to Dong in Thailand. Yeah? So Ajahn Brahm went and visited many of the very famous meditation masters. Uh, and one of us, he visited this Ajahn Sing Tong. Yeah? He came to the Tongue. Yeah? And uh, one of the things that was uh, remarkable about Ajahn Sing Tong, Ajahn Brahm noticed straight away, was how jokey he was. Yeah? How he always liked to be relaxed, how he liked to mess around with the lay people. And Ajahn Brahm noticed that because he was such a joker, yeah? because he liked to have a good time, because he did things in a strange way, in an unusual way. He was so beloved by all the local villagers. The villagers loved him, yeah, because he was easygoing and everyone could have a laugh together. And of course, as part of that, having a good time and laughing and enjoying things, then you also have the ability to pop in the Dhamma seeds, the pill of wisdom can be popped in when your mouth is open. Yeah, When you're laughing away, bang, in goes the seed, the, the pill of wisdom uh, as a consequence of your of people having a good time. Because when you are relaxed, when you are at ease, when you are enjoying yourself, then that is when your mind is open, has the ability to take things on board. If you are tense or you can't really or whatever, it's almost impossible to take the Dhamma seed on board in a very deep sense. The mind has to be free. The mind has to be at ease. Then these things can go in. So he was beloved, yeah, and for that reason, yeah, he was also able to teach the Dhamma to great effect. And Ajahn Pram tells that one of the strange things about the monastery was that when he was giving the 
Anemodana blessing, yeah, after the villagers had given all, given the food, he was going to give the Anemodana blessing. He did this in a very strange way. Yeah. I don't know, you know, you probably, many of you will obviously know the Anemodana. Yeah, the Anemodana is kind of, it's like, Yatta parivaha pura paripurenti sagarang evang eva itodinang, etc. Kind of typical Anemodana. But when he chanted this Anemodana, he would increase the volume and he would he would he would give the pitch would kind of go up and up and up doing this yeah until it reaches a kind of volume a very high pitch towards the very end and it was so silly it was so different to doing things that at the end of this chanting almost all the villagers and everyone burst out laughing because it was so different and unusual and this is kind of the pitch of a you know of someone who is a spiritual special person uh, that instead of just allowing the forms and the habits of the world to frame us and to uh, force us into a certain way of doing things uh, instead we are a bit more inventive uh, afraid to break with convention not afraid to do things differently as long as it is moral as long as it coming from kindness uh, you do these things to enable the transmission of the dhamma and you become a true spiritual friend as a consequence uh, so Ajahn Brahm learned a lot just by that one visit to Ajahn Singh Tong's monastery. And he, uh, later on, I don't know if some of you have heard this, but sometimes when you, uh, Ajahn Brahm does his Anumodana blessing, he also does it uh, in a kind of special way. And that is in large part inspired by Ajahn Singh Tong in Thailand, doing it in the same way. Yeah. What's interesting about Ajahn Singh Tong, while I'm talking about him, is that uh, he, he was, you know, this was the way he was uh, and he wasn't afraid. He was a very confident kind of monk. He was always doing things his own way. And he was one of the few monks who did a prank even on Ajahn Mahaboa. You probably heard about Ajahn Mahaboa, a famous monk in Thailand. And he was very famous for being very feared. And people would often be afraid of him and they might be intimidated. But there was one monk who was not intimidated, and that was Ajahn Singh, because of his kind of light hearted mind or whatever. And on, on one occasion, Ajahn Singh Tong was staying in Ajahn Mahaboa's monastery. And while he was staying in Ajahn Mahaboa's monastery, uh, one morning he was up too late. Yeah, everyone is supposed to wake up early in the morning, 3 a.m., go to the meditation hall, and then have it to meditation sit. That was kind of the process in that monastery at that time. But this morning he woke and he knew that in that monastery, if you didn't make it in time for the morning meditation, you wouldn't be able to eat. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to go on arms round, and there was no way that you were going to be able to eat as a consequence. And he wasn't too happy with that. He wanted to eat. Yeah, he wanted to have his meal. There's only one meal a day. If you had to forego that one meal, oh, it's a lot of dukkha. So he wanted to get his meal. So he thought, what can I do? Yeah, and he was a prankster. He was a joker. So he thought, what can I do to get this meal after all? How can I get around these rules, avoid this particular rule of the monastery? Yeah. He was a bit naughty, yeah? and he was thinking in different ways, doing things in a different way. It's kind of what is so endearing and charming by a monk like this. So he, um, uh, what he did, yeah, he went out of his kuti, and then he walked into the forest. And when he came into the forest, he was able to catch one of the wild chicken. Very hard to catch because these wild chickens are very fast, but he had his technique. He was able to catch it. And then he tied a string around the neck of the chicken. And then he dragged the chicken back into the monastery. And you can imagine a chicken that dragged into the is not going to be a happy chicken. Yeah, in the forest. So because of that, it was, it was uh, uh, you know, doing the, the, the noises, the sounds of a chicken uh, at full uh, throttle, full, full as, as loud as possible. So as he was coming to the monastery, everyone in the monastery, every all the monks sitting in the main hall, they could hear this chicken being dragged into the monastery because the sound was so, no so, so loud. Uh, and uh, then after everyone had heard the chicken, uh, uh, and everyone had seen that Adan Singh Tong had come before the chicken into the monastery. Then he untied the string from the chicken's neck, let the chicken run back into the forest, and then went into the hall. And he said to Ajahn Mahaboa, he said, 
I arrived before the chicken. I arrived before the chicken. And in Thai, what that means, if you arrive before a chicken, is an idiom, which means that you arrive early because the chickens are always up early in the morning. Yeah. So if you arrive before the chicken, wow, chickens are really early. And when he said that, I arrived before the chicken, saying he arrived early, everyone in the room burst out laughing. Yeah. It was a possible period. Someone who had gone to all this trouble to do something special, to say that he arrived before the chicken, to say that he arrived early. And everyone burst out laughing. I don't know if you know it. I don't know the story it hasn't been told in that detail, but he probably laughed as well. And then, of course, he allowed Ajahn Singh Tong to have his meal. And he allowed that simply because he was someone who was so inventive doing things in a different way. Yeah, He was the only monk in Thailand who was able to do pranks on Ajahn Mahaboa. And this was one of those pranks. Ajahn Mahaboa, too, had to give in, cave in to Ajahn Singh Tong. Yeah. And there's something about this, yeah, it's more than just a nice story. It is about uh, wise monks recognizing each other's, recognizing each other's independence, uh, recognizing the brightness, the lightness of the mind. Uh, and for that reason, uh, allowing special circumstances for in situations like that. Uh, it's a bit of a side issue from the main story, but it is kind of, it's interesting here. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a story also with Ajahn Singh Tong, yeah. And that is a story in his monastery, one of the big monks came from Bangkok. Yeah, these are the monks that are high up on the high in Bangkok. Yeah. And he was visiting at the monastery. Yeah. And then uh, when the food went around, yeah, they would all get the fish and they would get rice and they would get the sauce or whatever. And then uh, uh, when they got the fish, this important monk from Bangkok, he would break the head off the fish, put the head in the spittoon. Yeah, because cannot eat the head of the fish actually you can i mean everyone knows about fish head curry and all of that but you know for him he was a high ranking monk he was not going to eat the fish head so he put that in the spittoon to throw it out and when ajahn singh tong saw that he was he, he thought it was terrible so what he did yeah on purpose in plain sight so everyone can see it he holds up his fish he breaks off the head puts the body of the fish in the spittoon and puts the head in his bowl to eat yeah <laughs> and again, everyone burst out laughing because it was just so funny. Uh, not only funny because of what he did, but funny because he had the nerve to do something like that in the presence of a senior monk. Yeah. That was kind of the, the remarkable thing about him. So, and again, this shows you uh, the wisdom of somebody, the wisdom of independence, uh, the wisdom of doing things differently, the wisdom of not being too tied up in convention and ordinary things. Uh, uh, and the wisdom of having that inner joy that enables you to do pranks and do things in a way that nobody else uh, would do it. Uh, and that was what Ajahn Singh Tong had in kind of great abundance. Uh, but sometimes the wisdom comes out in strange ways. It comes out in, the, of course, how we speak, how we deal with people, but it also comes out in the, you know, our sense of fun, our sense of joy in life, uh, and also our sense of independence in a sense. Being, uh, separate, being our own people, our own men and women, doing things in our own way. Yeah. So that is about wisdom. One, the last story, a very simple story I want to tell is uh, also really about wisdom. I think sometimes these uh, uh, things like wisdom and kindness, they are better understood uh, through stories and, and through maybe dry sutta quotes. Uh, uh, and this is a story of Ajahn Brahm again, coming back to my own teacher, because uh, he is in many ways very special to me. And uh, this was a story when Ajahn Brahm was on a pilgrimage in India. Ajahn Brahm doesn't go very often on pilgrimage in India, but sometimes it does. And yeah, he's been there maybe two or three times, or maybe four times, I'm not sure, something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, as you, many of you will know, when you go pilgrimage to India, it is not always easy. There are lots of things in India that are quite different the way things are in Australia or Malaysia or uh, whatever. And uh, one of the biggest problems in India is the beggars. And the beggars never really give up. They are incredibly persistent. They keep on uh, nagging you and keep on holding on until they get some of you. 
And whether you are a monk or a layperson makes absolutely no difference. They are quite used to monks having money. But just because you're a monk, it's not going to leave you alone. So on this particular occasion, this was Ajahn Brahm. He was made to Port Gaya, into the holy temple at Port Gaya. Many people said this is one of the most inspiring places of Buddhism. Some people get inspired elsewhere, but some people get very inspired at Port Gaya. So Ajahn Brahm is on his way into this beautiful place of Buddhism. And as he is, he, this beggar comes up to him. Yeah? And once the beggar kind of talks to Ajahn Brahm, he's not going to give up. The problem is Ajahn Brahm doesn't have any money. Yeah? There's no way that Ajahn Brahm can give this beggar really anything. All he has is his robes and a pair of sandals. And that's really all he has. So uh, the beggar keeps on persisting. And Abraham is not entirely sure what to do until he realizes that uh, actually here you need to think outside of the box. So what Abraham does, uh, and this is kind of the how the beggar eventually leaves. Yeah, The beggar, beggar leaves, he lets Abraham be, because he realizes that Abraham is quite uh, special in many ways. Uh, what Abraham does uh, this is something that probably no one else would do in the whole world. Maybe, maybe there are some exceptions. But he turns around to the beggar. He picks the beggar up from the ground. And when he picks the beggar up from the ground, he gives the beggar a hug. Lifts him up from the ground and gives him a hug. Then, of course, when the beggar is given a hug in this way, he's put down on the ground again, he's beaming. He's smiling from ear to ear. These are very poor people. They have probably been abused by people around them, uh, taking advantage of them, using them to beg, and then using them to uh, you know, create money for their crime syndicate or whatever it is. And here, maybe for the first time in a long time, he's given a hug by somebody. And of course, after doing that, he realized that Adra Brahm is a very special person. No ordinary people will do that. And because of that, he then leaves Ajahn Brahm alone as a, as a consequence of that. Yeah? And it's kind of strange. Sometimes Ajahn Brahm, I don't know if Ajahn Brahm really wanted to get rid of the beggar or not. Maybe he didn't. But the consequence of having a beggar, which for most people is very annoying, the consequence of dealing with him in a way that had compassion, that had kindness, that had wisdom at the same time, actually meant that Ajahn Brahm was left alone. He was a small Dhamma teacher. Yeah? Uh, probably that beggar, I don't know if that beggar became a, a Buddhist afterwards, uh, but surely he must have become very, by the way, by the actions of Buddhists, uh, by seeing this kind of thing. Yeah. So um, these are some small stories uh, for you. The reason why I'm telling all of these stories today is because I've been writing out some stories uh, uh, recently, uh, so they've kind of been on my mind, uh, and I usually like to teach uh, things that are on my mind. Uh, but uh, remember that these are the issues that are required. If you want to be a good spiritual companion for the people around you, if you want to be a Kalyanamitta, of course, you should find your own Kalyanamittas in the world, the Buddha, uh, whoever uh, lives in the right way in this world. Uh, but if you are going to be a Kalyanamitta to others, uh, this is what you need to do. Be kind. Be caring. Don't expect too much of other people. Do it simply because it is an act of kindness, an act of generosity. And as you do that, as you use that wisdom, you have use those little things, uh, you too, every one of you, will become an inspiration for others uh, and you will help the growth of Buddhism, your own growth and also the people around you in the same way. And when we can all inspire each other in this way, then we are certainly being, uh, we are allowing for Buddhism to become a force for good in the world for ourselves uh, and also for people. Uh, Okay, so that is, uh, I'm going to stop there. I've been going for almost an hour already. And uh, I know that uh, Brother Bobby would like to uh, take some questions. I'm happy to take some questions for the next 20 uh, minutes or so. So uh, let us uh, uh, get started. So should I just read the questions out, Bobby? Uh, yes, Achan. Are the questions in the chat box? Yeah? Okay, so okay, I'll go into the chat box. Okay, let's see. Okay, so um, uh, these are uh, some of the questions. Please feel free to ask some questions if you, if you like. I'm quite happy I have about 20 minutes or so, and we can go on with this, this thing. So the first question is from Niwern. Hello, Niwern. 
Now I know how you spell your name, which is very interesting. Yeah, so that's good. <laughs> so your question is, uh, uh, actually, question one, should, uh, maybe I should start with question one. So let's start with the bottom one here. There are times when I feel disconnected from the people around me. I tend to worry about what others think of me, and I'm afraid to be judged by others. Uh, there are also times when I feel that I do not do enough for my friends. Uh, how can I overcome this in order to be more at ease, that I can connect better uh, with others? Uh, um yes and i one of the there's many reasons why we feel uh, disconnected from other people and one of the reasons i think you stated here quite obviously yeah you are afraid to be judged by others uh, and you worry about other things other people think about you this is so common yeah almost everyone has these kind of uh, issues uh, mm -hmm. uh, but when you are when you think about yourself uh, when we become like egocentric, yeah. that is also when you uh, feel disconnected because you are precisely because you are concerned about yourself. It means that you are creating a barrier between you and others. And this is why um, sensual desire, the first of the five hindrances, uh, actually is such a big hindrance. It's a hindrance to metta, it's a hindrance to compassion because it is about self-concern. We look at ourselves rather than looking at the world beyond us. And uh, so very important to, to understand that because when you understand that, you start to understand that too much desire in the world, too much desire for all the things actually is a kind of, is a selfishness. And that selfishness actually creates a boundary between us and others, a barrier between us. And it kind of makes it very hard to have that compassion and care that ideally we want to, want to have. So uh, what I would say is uh, practice, um, practice more metta. Yeah, see if you can do some metta meditation. I noticed that Dr. Victor Wee, he does metta meditations every Wednesday at the BGF. And so take, take part in that or find your own way of doing it. Or, or whatever, because that metta, it breaks down some of that self -turned. Living in our own little world, living in our own little bubble, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, bricked up, bricked away from others. Uh, we cannot reach out to others anymore. Uh, and it's one of the ways of doing that. Uh, but also remember that metta is often, and I think this is one of those very, very important things to understand, that metta meditation is only one thing. Uh, but really the foundations of metta are laid down in how we live and how we treat other people. Uh, Make sure that you, you know, you carry on with your kindness and you carry on with showing that metta in your daily life. And then when you do that, that is when your metta meditation will come together. So uh, allow those, um, you know, it's never going to be perfect. Don't put the bar too high. If you, if you set the bar too high, uh, you're going to get frustrated with yourself, frustrated with the world. Uh, but just understand this and then work towards it in a very, you know, gradual process. Uh, don't expect yourself to be perfect with this because it's not going to work, but just uh, gradually move in that direction. And, uh, sometimes you feel that you're not doing enough for your friends. Well, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes we can't do enough. Ideally, sometimes we, our ideals are often too high. We uh, try to do more than we actually can do. You have limitations. Uh, and uh, so make sure that, uh, you know, whatever time you have with your friends, uh, make that extra high quality. So you really make the most out of it. Uh, but don't expect things of yourself that you cannot do. Uh, know your own limits. Uh, it's more important that we spend a little amount of time, make that really high quality, and that we spend lots of time together uh, and make it low quality. This is one of the things I told my parents when I became a monk. My parents were not happy when I became a monk. And I said, oh, we will never see you. You're going to be you know, in Australia, far away or whatever. And I said to them, well, quality is more important than quantity. And they were not too happy with that argument. Yeah, they said, what? What do you mean? What do you mean quality is more important than quantity? We, don't, we want to see you. And uh, <laughs> it took a long time before they got that. But eventually, they did understand. Yeah, they did understand that having a son who is a buddhist monk actually is a great blessing this is what you know is much better to just talk to you once a month or whatever over the phone than to have this constant interaction which often is not very positive, which often is a bit false a bit negative it's actually not that useful 
And the same thing with your friends and your families, uh, and you weren't, is that, you know, uh, don't, they, uh, don't expect too much of yourself, uh, but expect that like, when you are with them, uh, when you do things, then do things well and do things to a high quality. The things that you do well, rather than kind of being uh, available at all times. Uh, it's important that we keep our batteries charged. Otherwise, if you uh, discharge your batteries too much, you're not going to be able to help help anyone. So, um, yeah. The other thing is that, you know, I being afraid of being judged by others, and I think this is one of the things that we, uh, we have to let go of, uh, it's important to remember that other people don't really understand us. Uh, other people's judgment is something that, well, you can't control it, obviously, uh, but uh, it's something that you have to learn to live with. Uh, nobody is going to be perfectly uh, liked and loved by everyone, and everyone to judge. We're all going to judge each other differently here. Uh, and uh, sometimes you just have to shrug your shoulders and say, it's not your problem. It is their problem if they judge you. People who are very gentle have very miserable lives. Yeah, being judgmental is actually a very painful state of affairs. So instead of uh, feeling bad about that, uh, have compassion for people you know, because understand that they don't really know what they're doing. Yeah? You are a good Yeah, you do all the things to the best of your ability. And if people want to judge you and when you do the things to the best of your ability, it's not your problem. It is their problem. So turn it around and make you have compassion for them instead. And then you will let go of that sense of the afraid of being judged straight away here. Because then there's a very different situation. Your job is to make sure you do the right thing, you live well, and then that is really all you can do. Okay, let's. Um, Go on to the next uh, question. Uh, this is from Kyun Si Ki, and uh, are singing and dancing a five precepts? Uh, and the answer is no. Singing and dancing is not against the five precepts. Uh, it is against the uh, the eight precepts. Yeah, but when when you follow the eight precepts, that's when you uh, try to restrain a little bit. You try to move away from the sensual indulgence. Of the, so if you ever go on a retreat and you want to take your meditation a bit deeper, that's when you should really focus on the eight precepts. And that's where you kind of avoid the dancing and singing here. But a bit of dancing is for most people, not for a, for a monastic, of course, but for most people, it is just part of life. So, uh, you know, don't indulge too much, but it's certainly fully, fully acceptable within the five precepts. Okay, and uh, then we have a, uh, another question from, let me just take this, there's another question here from Like Him Loy. Uh, so the question is, uh, no, this is not from Lee, Li, sorry, Li Li Quinn. And this is, the question is, are white lies considered lies? And hence the breaking this. Uh, especially if the intention was meant to be fun or surprise and not meant in a bad light. And, uh, uh, the answer to this question is that all morality in Buddhism, uh, it comes down to what your motivation is, why you are doing things. Yeah? And if you're doing things because of greed, because of delusion, because of ill will and anger, then it is bad. That is really the definition of badness. Uh, too often people focus on the five precepts, but the five precepts are really approximations to morality here. It has to do with the motivations, the roots, they call the head to Kali Sutras. And if you are coming from kindness, from care, and all these things, then it cannot really be immoral. And, <coughs> excuse me, the way that lies are defined, especially in the suttas, is example, you know, it is if you are in the court, in a court case, and the judge says to you, well, please, the truth, the full truth and nothing but the truth. And you put your hand on the Bible, no, not the Bible, of course, you put the Quran, no, no, not the Quran either, on the Dhammapada, yeah, something like that. And when you put your hand on the Dhammapada and you promise to tell the truth, and then you lie, that is when it is bad because you are supposed to tell the truth in that particular situation. You even make a promise. That is the really bad one. So we are doing it for some ulterior motive. You want to 
protect yourself or protect your friends or because you are greedy or whatever, then it is really bad. But if you uh, tell a white lie, maybe because, as you say, you want to have some fun, maybe you're telling a joke, which kind of maybe isn't quite true, or you are uh, maybe you're trying to protect somebody. Yeah, someone is not ready and you tell a white lie, then it is not such a big deal. Ideally, you want to avoid that as well. Ideally, you try to say something else. Yeah, oh, I, this is not the right time for me to talk or something like that. Uh, but if you do lie in those circumstances, uh, it is uh, far less severe than if you do because you are coming from greed or ill will and anger. Uh, so morality is uh, comes in shades of gray. It is not either good or bad. Very often we talk about morality being either either you are good or you're bad what you're doing, but actually it's not as simple as that. It's kind of all, all shades of gray. And that's why we get reborn as a human being, because you know it is a kind of a, a both good and bad actions that lead to rebirth as human beings. So, uh, so yeah, so be careful. Yeah, don't kind of be, make sure that you look at your mind, you are clear about what your intention and motivation are. Make sure that if you are gonna lie that you are very clear about why you're doing it. You don't do it because of greed and anger and delusion, uh, but it is maybe necessary at a certain time. Uh, you can do it. It is not something that you do easily. Uh, then you are, I would say, thinking about it in the right way. Uh. Okay, so um, we then have another question from uh, Neil, and uh, this is uh, uh, as follows. Uh, there are many Buddhists who think they are doing good by giving another fellow Buddhist long lectures about Buddhism, thinking they are sharing Dhamma. It can be quite irritating. <laughs> what should be your a good approach to share Dhamma without irritating them, uh, others? Uh, and uh, yes, I, uh, I know what you mean because I think this is quite a common experience in the world. Uh, and I think very often what happens is that we get very enthusiastic about the Dhamma. Yeah? We feel like we have understood something. We feel like we have, see, have some insight into the word of the Buddha. And then we want to share with others and we get really excited about it. And then we forget that the other person may not be as excited as we are. And this is often the problem. Right? So uh, again, I would just, you know, um, uh, when you are going to share Dhamma with others, do it if you are invited. Yeah, if you are invited to give a talk at the BGF and people come on their own accord because they want to listen to you, or they ask you a question, that's a good time to share. Or you can say, well, you know, I have a, a, a point that may be of interest. Can I talk to you about this particular point? Uh, so make it in a way where that, whereby the other person has a chance to withdraw, not to engage. Yeah, this, I think, is the the right way of doing it. And also remember that the way we inspire others is not by lecturing other people, but telling them about Buddhism. If someone tells you about, gives you a long lecture about Buddhism, uh, but uh, they don't act accordingly, they don't live in a particular way, they, they don't have a, a great sort of kindness inside of themselves, and they're not uh, a very compassionate as a person or whatever, then the words are not very useful. We aren't really going to listen to a person because we know it is all quite superficial. It doesn't come from the heart in a real way. And this is why you know, the senior and all the people who have been living this life for a long time, who live it well, why they are so inspiring. The word and action are in harmony with each other. This is so powerful. When you hear the words and you see the actions being in harmony, it really is real. And you listen to people like that precisely because it's real. So that's what we should strive for. We shouldn't really so much to teach it. We should strive much more to live in the right way. It is fascinating. Someone like Ajahn Brahm, he doesn't usually teach all that much. Yeah? When you're with Ajahn Brahm and I'm with him all the time, he often just joke around and have a good time. And he doesn't really say anything about Dhamma. The only time he says something about Dhamma is really when he gives talks. The rest of the time is about being jovial and enjoying and being kind to each other. That is the main, main thing. So come back to that, yeah? And then point people in the right direction. Point people to good Dhamma teachings. Point people to the suttas, the other suttas of the Buddha. That is, I think, our main um, 
obligation as Buddha, that, that is my main obligation as a monk to actually point people to the sutta so they can get the real, go to the source of what Buddhism is about. Uh, of course, sometimes you need more than just the sutta. You need an explanation, you need uh, uh, other talks as well, but that is a very, ultimately, that is where everything really should come from. Uh, so, uh, Anyway, so uh, good. There's always going to be people who, uh, you know, who lecture and talk about Dhamma in this way. And other people do that, have compassion with them, understand that they are excited about something that they have discovered. Yeah, they're not doing it probably to, uh, to hassle you at all. They're doing it because they want to do the right thing. So when you think like that, then you can have more, you can be more patient with them. And then if they go on, for, you can say, oh, yeah, I've, got to, I've got to go to the toilet now or whatever. And then you go to the toilet and then you kind of, you know, you go down the back way afterwards. You don't have to, to see them. So it's okay to make little excuses like that. But um, and I think something like that, and then hopefully you can, you know, it will uh, be, uh, it will work out for you. Okay, so let's uh, take a couple more uh, questions. So these are the uh, uh, next question is from... Uh, Felicia Tai, and uh, she is asking, is taking health tonic, which normally contains a low percentage of alcohol as a supplement, considered breaking our precepts, uh, Sadhu? The, uh, the, the thing about taking alcohol, uh, you know, the Pali word which uh, goes sura uh, meraya manja pamadatana meramani, yeah, that, that's how it goes, that, that particular rule. And uh, yeah, if you want what it says is sura merya manja, they're all words for alcohol. Pamadatana means they are a basis for heedlessness yeah, or a basis for losing your ability to see things clearly. So if it is a, a tiny amount of alcohol, which is taken as part of a health tonic, yeah, yeah, it, is not a, it is not really a problem. So I, if I were you, I wouldn't worry about that. For monks, it's a bit different because for monks, you know, if you smell of alcohol, it might come, come, come look really bad. And for monks actually cannot do anything which is not alcohol. But even for a monk, if something has alcohol, you cannot smell it or you cannot see it, even monks are allowed to drink something which contains alcohol. If it is such a small amount, you can't really tell it is present. Yeah? So even for monks, there is a little bit of a kind of a loophole there, if you like. Yeah. There was a famous story. There was a story of uh, one of the monks who used to live at Bodhidharma Mistress and Nanadamo, you may have heard of. Uh, and he had been delayed and he was coming back to Perth. Uh, and when he came off the plane, he was stinking of whiskey. Yeah, there was like, whoa, it was like a cloud of whiskey coming off him. Uh, and because of this cloud of whiskey, the monks who were waiting for him at the airport, they started laughing when he came what on earth have you been doing on the plane? And then he told the story it was that there was a man sitting next to him. And this man sitting next to him, he was very nervous. He was one of these very scared people, yeah, scared of flying. And because of that, he had all this whiskey around him, drinking whiskey all the way through on the flight. And as they were coming to Perth, he was so nervous and so scared that he spilled all this whiskey over Ajanyana. So he was full of, he was drenched in whiskey as he came through the airport. And uh, as, as Ajahn Brahm says, well, that was the story. So that's the story we, that we know about Ajahn, what happened to Ajahn Yara. I'm just, I'm just messing around, of course. So, uh, but uh, it just comes to mind when, you, when you're asking that question. But please, don't be reasonable with it. Be, think clearly about these things. And this kind of thing is not an issue as far as I'm concerned, unless you drink the health tonic for the alcohol. If you drink it for the alcohol, then of course you shouldn't be doing it. But I'm sure you're not doing it. I'm sure you're doing it for the health reasons, in which case there is no problem. Okay, maybe one last question. And this is from Monica Chang. Uh, how do we make a judgment between kind to a friend and having uh, some healthy boundaries that can also allow for personal growth? Uh, yes, so you have to know how to be kind, and this is why, uh, when we're going to be kind with the world and we're going to be kind people, it always has to be balanced with wisdom. There is no kindness, there's no kindness, the real compassion without wisdom. 
And the wisdom is boundaries. When uh, you are, are depleted, knowing that it is, things go too far. Now, kindness is not about quality. Kindness is often about quality of interaction. Now, you don't have to be with somebody all the time. An example before of myself being a pumpkin. <laughs> It means that my ability to be with my family is quite limited. But when I am with them, I can give a lot more. And it's far more interesting to have an interaction with a son who is a monk than having an interaction with a son who is an engineer. I used to be an engineer before I became so Much more interesting because an engineer, well, you can talk about engineering things, but you don't know anything about the mind. You don't know anything about wisdom. So, and this is the same for you. So make sure that you have high quality interactions. The quantity is not what matters. The quality is what matters. Make sure that your batteries are recharged. Make sure you have a sense of kindness and compassion inside of you when you interact. And when you do that, that is when these things are meaningful. So this is not about quantity, it's about quality. And then you can be able to find the right balance in your life. Okay, I think that is uh, for today. And I wish you all well in KL and in Malaysia, wherever you are. And I hope you all are dealing well with the situation of COVID and everything else in the world and that you are thriving. This is a good time to have the Dhamma as our guide because this is a time when the world uh, is going in funny places and how incredibly fortunate we are to have the Dhamma at a time like this. So get too excited about the difficulties, instead use the opportunity to take these marvelous teachings to heart and make something really wonderful out of it. Thank you very much and hopefully I will see you again soon. Sadhu Achan. Achan, thank you for the one very inspiring and very practical sharing. Achan, could you uh, do the sharing of merits with us? Sure, of course, yeah. So we'll do a, a, a sharing merits and we'll do this in the uh, traditional traditional way here. Yeah. <laughs> Edang men yate nang hotu sukita hontu nyata yo. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you, Achan, uh, for the very inspiring sharing. For next week, we have Uncle Vijaya who will be coming on at uh, 9 30 on the 14th of December and on the 28th of. Uh, uh, sorry, 14th of June. And on the 28th of June, we are having a nun, Ben Roche Yu Teng from the Po Kuang Sang to share on humanistic Buddhism in turbulent times. So looking forward to sharing, uh, look, having all of you tune in next week and the week, uh, two weeks later. Thank you. Uh, bye, 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 bye. Bye. bye.